Hi, this is Bruce Ross, and I'm speaking again with Dr. Bob Rosenthal, and we've been going through his wonderful new book, From Nevermind to Evermind, and uh, the last couple of weeks we've talked about <laughs> yay, <laughs> uh, the first two chapters in his book, and this third one is really kind of a wonderful um, uh, cha change of focus in uh, going to touching Evermind, the perfect moment. And it's, it kind of introduces us to, uh, I guess, what we could call the courses version of epiphanies and, and those, those uh, uh, truly beyond magic, I think, uh, experiences where we, we touch the heart of what A Course in Miracles uh, is hinting at all along, that uh, there's a, yeah. piece, a piece that transcends anything we could possibly imagine. Uh, but we get glimpses of it, don't we? And so, anyway, would you like to, to you know, make some opening remarks on, on what inspired yeah. this chapter? And, and I, you gave three wonderful examples at and, the and, uh, beginning. Oh, of the thank you. Yeah. Thank, yeah, I, I, you know, this is, um, I, I'd like to give a little bit of background. You know, I always find it fascinating when um, authors share a little bit about their process. So originally, I had intended this to be the first chapter. And I started writing it, and at a certain point, I realized that I was immersing the reader in in too much of an experience without building a context for it. As uh, mm -hmm. as as the second chapter was all about, you know, we we process things in terms of contrast and context. And so then I I kind of put it aside um, in a very incomplete form and thought about what needed to come first and then that led to those first two chapters which are essentially a um, deconstruction of the ego's view of what is the self and a deconstruction of the ego's view is what is perception you know what is the world that we think is there outside of us so after making i think a fairly solid case that self and the world are both unreliable um, ego constructs mm -hmm. I was like, oh, now, all right, this is the perfect place to then get into what is the experience or a taste of the experience like when we actually are able to um, open the doors of perception as, you know, the Aldous Huxley's book uh, title uh, suggests or, or, you know, deconstruct self enough that never mind is, you know, shoot off to the side and we actually get uh, a breath of Evermind coming in. Um, a Course in Miracles is, you know, very, very clear many times, but particularly I think at the beginning of the clarification of terms, that its goal is not to teach you theology or some philosophy that, you know, you can go around and spout and look, you know, all intellectual and smart about. It's about an experience, It's you know, and and the beautiful thing about experience, and I, I think I addressed this in the book, at least I hope I do, um, is once you have it, it's yours. You know, if if you, uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, often I find that people try to tell me, um, oh, well, you don't understand X, Y, or Z. You don't understand A Course in Miracles because, no, no, the world really is real and God made it and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, if that's your experience, that's fine. But it's not my experience. And therefore, having had that experience, there's a certainty that can never be taken from you. And following on that experience, your trust that what A Course in Miracles is teaching us is accurate and true, your trust grows. And from that trust, there follows more experience. And from that experience, you gain greater trust. And, and this is how it, you know, this is how the learning proceeds. So this isn't just true for um, the, the, the kinds of events that um, I describe in this chapter, which would more commonly be called mystical experiences. It's also true for miracles. You know, when you're stuck and you see no way through and suddenly you let it go and give it to the Holy Spirit and, you know, your perception about something shifts and you allow perception to be corrected and boom, you know, the problem doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. That's pretty compelling stuff. Uh, so, so it was in that spirit that I wanted to offer this before getting back into, all right, you know, 
what is never mind, what is ever mind, and who are we really? Um, you know, and that what I find the uh, to be the profound insight that I try to share in chapter five, which we already discussed in our, our first uh, talk about this book. Uh, we'll have to figure out whether we want to go back and do that again or, uh, or you know, or, or do something else. Um, so, so yeah, this, this chapter is kind of like, all right, if you move ego self, never mind, uh, off to the side, because it's very hard to get rid of completely while we're still here. Um, the practice section of chapter two, I think, tried to demonstrate how to quiet ego mind, but also its persistence. But when we can push it off to the side and make space, make room for the invitation to the Holy Spirit, then this is the kind of experience we can have. And uh, yeah, I gave um, three examples uh, from my own life. Interestingly, they were all from very early on before I started doing A Course in Miracles uh, and before I'd met, uh, you know, then Judy Scotch and now Judy Whitson. Um, but they, they're just such striking examples. And, um, you know, and as I say in some place in the chapter, it would be hard for me to give you an example of that now because any time that I take the time to really go inward, when I come back out, that is how the world feels. You know, no, okay, maybe it's not so suffused with light as, you know, a genuine quote unquote mystical experience, but there's a palpable sense, and, 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 and this is really important, there's a palpable sense of unreality because our sense of what's real is, has been transcended, but there's an equally powerful and actually even more powerful sense of reality with a capital R because what we're allowing to come in is so much more real than the world of perception. So it's this very strange kind of, um, you know, double-edged or uh, double-sided um, sense of, oh my God, you know, nothing's real. And yet the experience itself is so real that when, you know, when it kind of starts fading out, no question, it's more real than anything, than anything here, anything you've imagined. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I try to make the case that once you've experienced it, yeah, that's where you want to be. Um, it's better than winning the Super Bowl. It's better than having that male or female or gender neutral or whoever it is person um, finally tell you that they love you after you've been pursuing them for 12 years or, you know. <laughs> There's no experience in this world that can match it precisely because it's an experience in this world, which is a world of illusion and keeps us running, you know. Um, and I talk about this, you know, later on, uh, but, but if you've lived long enough, you've certainly had the experience where something you wanted very, very much actually comes your way and you're giddy and delighted, dot, 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 for a while. Because every one of those fades and peters out and leaves you going, oh, you know, is that all there is? Well, what's next? Um, yeah. But not a mystical experience. Uh, that they're complete in and of themselves because they are windows onto eternity. Um, so, yeah, there's the short version of the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and since, see, we happen to be recording this on Valentine's Day in 2019. That's right. And, and, and so happy Valentine's Day. Um, it, it's, to you too. Uh, to, to me, it seems very appropriate that you know. I, I know your 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 whole another whole book. I think is going to be devoted to special relationships, but it's certainly um, you know since since you're you know and it's, it's kind of hard to write anything about the course without talking about the obstacles to peace and and how you know we have mm. to get those out of the way or turn the volume down on on the ego's ticker tape uh, chatter or whatever whatever metaphor comes to mind, but. Uh, Certainly, you know, the experience of, like you say, having, you know, a, a supposedly achieved some, some uh, goal in, in the world that involves, uh, you know, others, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, a relationship uh, goal or a, or a uh, you know, a, a career uh, uh, strategy that you've finally has paid off or, or some kind of a, a financial thing or, or some sort of health goal or, you know, all, all the different things in the world that seem to be things that we strive for. And then you, you, and you, in your exercise in the back of the chapter, list all the things that we preoccupy ourselves yeah. with that, you know, yeah. are examples of, you know, 
standing in the way, uh, typically, uh, you know, the ego's constant propaganda machine of, of saying, well, you, you can't have a mystical experience just right now. You need to attend all these, these things. And, you know, re, you know, irrespective of the fact that you can actually uh, chew gum and walk, uh, <laughs> to use a familiar <laughs> phrase, you know, we, we actually can uh, stay in, in uh, with practice, a, a more and more peaceful state that has that, uh, if you will, mystical quality to it by remembering uh, that it's not about the outcome. It's about my choice of teacher at any given moment. Uh, you know, exactly. Yeah. Well, and that, okay. So within the ego's world of form and perception, um, we strive, we want to get, there's something out there that we believe we don't have and we try to chart a course that will allow us to obtain that elusive something um, and make it ours. And sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. And here's the sad thing, when we make it ours, we tend to make it part of our identity. Right. Um, so, you know, in our last talk, we were, I used the metaphor of sort of a beach construction with a lot of driftwood and, you know, crap from the ocean and flotsam and jitsam, and we put it all together and that's the self-concept. You know, we do this with the things that we get. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, you know, I'm Tom Brady. I'm married to, you know, whatever her name is, Giselle Bunchen. I've won six Super Bowls. All of these things glom onto the identity and ossify it. They lock it in and actually make it more difficult to have that opening that is the mystical experience. So there's this paradox that everything the world values will get in the way. I mean, there's that beautiful line in the text that says, you know, um, you know, everything the ego, uh, everything you think you want will hurt you or everything the ego uh, thinks it wants will hurt you. And the first time you come on it, it's like, wow, that's, I don't understand that. <laughs> uh -huh. But that's, that's what it's saying. It will hurt you because you're actually putting up, as you said, another obstacle to peace. So the path to um, achieving that, that mystical vision, if you will, it's not a path of doing. It's not something you can, um, you know, make a five-year plan for or uh, buy a best-selling book and, all right, I'm going to do this and I'm going I'm to use my affirmation every morning. <laughs> That's for the things of this world. Mm -hmm. A Course in Miracles is so clear. It's about undoing. So at, in that practice that you were referring to at the end of the chapter, you know, I thought, well, how can I, how can I help people practice getting to this? And it's like, well, you can't, but you can help them look at what might be blocking them from getting this. And so I tried to come up with all of the things that in my own experience block me from that, you know, the, the little things that my ego voice comes in and starts yammering and chattering in my head saying, well, no, I mean, even today, I've been doing this for 43 years and more because I had mystical experiences before I came into the course. And I'll still sit down, do a workbook lesson, get to this lovely place where, ah, you know, I could just stay here forever because it is forever. And that little voice goes, yeah, but you know, you better check your email. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can so relate as you can imagine. Yeah. 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 And, and, and at the same time, there's, there's a, a, a residual quality of that piece that, that has a pull through effect with yeah. that, that basically, you know, the more we do it, the more it's like there's this, there's this um, kind of growing baseline of peace that carries through. And I, I think that is really what kind of gradually lifts us out of the, um, the compulsive identification with, you know, things in the world that, that, you know, the, whether it's a Tom Brady <laughs> example or, or, or more subtle things, you know, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, the, the superstardom. It can just be, oh, I have, you know, this, this story, you know, it can be, you know, and it can be a pretty mundane story, but, but by, by, by golly, it's my story. And, and to the degree that we're identified with a story, whether it's, it seems to be a glorious one or, uh, you know, a, you know, a horrific one or, or any, or any, you know, combination of qualities, as long as it roots us in a specific identity, that's basically, you know, the, the fodder for egos <laughs> warfare. That's it. You got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, just to be clear, I'm not advocating, and I'm pretty sure you're not advocating this idea that we jettison our personality somehow. I mean, 
No, of course, you know, of course. You yeah. come in with certain givens. You right. know, you can't right. get rid of your body um, because, well, you can, but I wouldn't advise it. Uh, <laughs> you know, it doesn't help you. It doesn't help anyone else. Right. You know, right. it's, it's uh, the course says denial of the body is a particularly unworthy form of denial. It's mm-hmm. here, but we can stop valuing it or believing that it has the ability to get us something that we want, right. which gets right. us right into specialness. Yep. You know, the idea that we can be special if only we get X, Y, or Z, or the flip side, we're special because we've suffered more than anybody else. Mm-hmm. You know, that person, may have, but, you know, I've recovered from six forms of cancer, escaped from three prisoner of war camps. And, <laughs> you know, yeah, there are people who've had horrible lives, <laughs> but how do you wear it? And to me, we can, you know, we can come through any experience, no matter how wonderful or how negative, and ultimately recognize that it was there to help us grow. Exactly. And so I picked Tom Brady mainly because if I try to think of someone whose life sounds like it's just gone perfectly, he'd be my guy. But then, you know, there is that old Simon and Garfunkel song, Richard Corey, uh, where, uh, you know, this working man is singing about the, 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 the multimillionaire who owns these factories in his town and, and is so rich and has orgies on his yacht and he must be happy, but I work in his factory and I hate the life I live. And, you know, and at the end of the song, it's, yeah, and Richard Corey went home one night and put a bullet through his head. But I work in his factories and I, you know, I mean, we don't know what the inside of anyone's life is like. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the fact is, to the extent that that life is, uh, is, is, is I, to, to the extent that that life is being led in pursuit of an ego goal, um, there's, there's going to be suffering and misery somewhere. Right. You know, I, I think the to me, the ultimate take home, and I think this was, you know, this is the Buddha's first noble truth. All life is suffering or dissatisfaction. Even if you had the perfect life, everybody you love is going to die. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about that. Mm-hmm. You know, if that's not hell, <laughs> I don't know what is. <laughs> right. and, and the course's response to that is, is, you know, that's one of the most outrageous ideas that you can lose someone or something you love. You yeah. Know? Yeah. 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 And, and that's like, wow, it puts it all in perspective, doesn't it? A, a moment ago when you're talking about, you know, the, the, the one, the seemingly wonderful, you know, in the world's terms life, and then the seemingly horrible and the, the you know, the, the, the three whole <laughs> Holocaust. <or children. laughs> I, I was thinking of uh, one of my favorite and it's hilarious uh, skits, uh, the Monty Pythons uh, oh, yes. group did with the, the four Yorkshiremen. Have you seen that one? I was thinking of the one where they're cutting off the uh, arms of the knight, and he's like, "Nope, I can still." Oh, yeah, well, that's a, that's another great one too, for sure. Yeah, the, the okay. black knight. No, yeah. no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, the, yeah. the four Yorkshiremen is, is these these you know, uh, four four of the Monty Python troop are sitting around in their in their smoking jackets and in you know comfortable chairs, you know, obviously enjoying a fine you know late in life kind of lifestyle, and and but they're reminiscing about well, it wasn't always this this easy, you know, and, and, you know, in fact, when I was a kid, you know, we had this such and such and such, and, and then each one, you know, escalates in a downward spiral. Well, you were lucky, you know, and they all almost yeah. all start with, you were lucky. I had to, you know, finally the last one is, uh, you know, the, you know, <laughs> something like, uh, we had to, you know, get up three hours before we went to sleep, and, and our, our my father would kill me three times before breakfast, and all we had was a lump of. Oh, you were lucky to have a lump of coal, you know. Yeah. And you were lucky to have a shoebox. We we didn't have a shoebox, and we had to, you know, sleep in a, a hole in the in the in the gutter, and then you know <laughs> that kind of thing. But it was it just goes on and on. But it's just kind of, you know, an example of how, you know, the no matter how you slice or dice the experience in the world, there's always going to be something that is inadequate or lacking and no matter you know if if you were the ruler of a galaxy there'd be other galaxies that that you you know that's right had to conquer yes. you know i mean or whatever you know so but, but yeah just just watching that 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 drivel that the the, the uh you know kind of like the crawl on the on the screen you know that <laughs> That it, you know, that there's the Holy Spirit's ticker tape, and then there's the ego's ticker tape, and it, it all yeah. depends on which one we listen to at any given moment. So yeah, yeah, yeah. no, exactly. And, and and that the Holy Spirit's is always the one that leads to those those perfect moments, those those mystical experiences where we just you know we we stop the 
the noise. You, you still kind of see it scrolling along, but it's like you, you, you no longer identify with it, it seems. Yeah. Well, that's where I love the, the biblical phrase, um, being in the world, but not of it. Mm -hmm. And I love the phrase, the peace that passeth understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if you sort of use those two as your guideposts, you'll have a sense of what the perfect moment or the mystical moment is. Um, and I'd like to say, I intentionally did not use the term holy instant that the Course uses because the way I read it, the holy instant is a moment where your perfect communication with God is restored. And um, I think it's more akin to revelation. Uh -huh. You know, I've had, I've heard people say, you know, oh yeah, you know, I was driving in my car on the freeway and I had a holy instant and I'm like, I don't know that that would be safe in a car. I don't think Holy <laughs> Spirit would let you do that. So that's why I a little disclaimer. You know, pull over if, if you're driving or upping, operating heavy equipment, right? Yeah. Right. Don't don't try this in your car. Uh, you know. Um, yeah. But um, I'm sorry, I lost the train of my thought now. Oh, I, but, <laughs> so, no, but yeah, no, this no. is why I called it a perfect moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, now I still lost that train of thought. Oh well. Um, if you have a sense of where we were, well, I think I think your your three examples that you start off of, you know, the, going out into nature and and how that can be a, a, a trigger. I, I uh, was re relating to one uh, where we were at uh, the Kipahulu. Uh, uh, we took the road to Hana and uh, on the island, mm. Big Island, of Hawaii. And I was not expecting this at all, but I remember walking up through this bamboo grove up above the. the what they call a seven sacred pools, I guess. And um, mm -hmm. there was this bamboo grove and it was like, I, you know, it was sort of like this, this organic cathedral of these giant hollow wooden spires. <sighs> and, and they were just so peaceful. And, and the wind was just gen still very gentle, but just enough to where these, you know, 30, 40, 50 foot tall, majestic, tropical <laughs> ambassadors wow. we're, we're just kind of making this this gentle clanking sound almost like this little little chorus of of you know a, a little song as we walked through this you know path through and again it was actually fairly dark through there because there was there was so much uh not so much the foliage but just the sheer mass of the of the the trunks of these bamboo trees and uh it was just kind of like the sort of you know mystical experience kind of thing just for a few moments and then you know i just, I just kind of stopped and, and listened and, and <laughs> felt this gentle breeze and it's like anyway one of those kind of things you know but uh um, yeah anyway it was, you can, at those moments you kind of suspend that personal sense of self and another experience in, in uh, the great pyramid uh in what they call the king's chamber in what they call the sarcophagus but i, I consider just a granite box in in the uppermost room because there, that could be a whole other talk about, you know, the Egyptian lore. Oh. But, but uh, you know, I, I lay down this thing and started toning and found like the, a thousand voice choir singing through me. Um, but yet, you know, there wasn't anything, you know, remarkable about the, well, the acoustics were kind of interesting, but it was more the, the experience of kind of letting go of a sense of self. And, uh, and then I realized I could, I, I could tune into that, that feeling and that experience elsewhere. And it wasn't contingent yeah. on, on a quote unquote sacred site that, that any place could be a sacred site. And then that began to extrapolate that to other places. And it's like, Oh yeah. Uh, I had a similar experience years ago with um, a friend of mine who uh, was a studio musician in Southern California who uh, got me into synthesizers cause that was his thing. Oh. And, and then he said, well, you check out this little biofeedback machine. This was back in the, in the, uh, the mid seventies. And um, I, I tried this machine that I could get into what they call an alpha state very quickly. And then I realized I don't need the machine. And, and I think of course, miracles is kind of on a similar, similar approach is, you know, the idea of having some specific experience that requires some particular circumstance or condition is really antithetical to, I think what the course is suggesting is that, you know, if we can remember that we have, the, the choice and the power in our mind at any given moment to choose the teacher of peace, that gives us the opportunity over time with practicing that to, to have a peaceful experience no matter what seems to be going on. 
So. Yeah, well, once again, the answer is never outside of us. It's exactly. always inside exactly. of us. Yeah. And, um, and I, I, I actually, I specifically address this in this chapter. There is this temptation when you've had an experience like this to attribute it to the circumstances or the place that you were in. Mm -hmm. And then there's this nasty um, little compulsion to try to repeat it by right. reestablishing those circumstances. And mm -hmm. it almost never works. Mm -hmm. uh, be, if only because now you're anticipating it and you're trying to get it out there. Right. Um, one of the things, you know, spontaneity is is a huge part of, of, of what makes that mystical experience work. But it's kind of cool if you think about it, that there are so many ways that if we simply pause the inner dialogue and invite the Holy Spirit in, so many um so many moments ha are laden with that potential for that sense of vision. Um, and, you know, I, I think that we find it in nature frequently because nature offers these vistas or the experience you were describing, you know, these tall bamboo, um, you know, spaces that, uh, that dwarf our physical body and allow our minds to kind of embrace the whole vista in this very expansive way um, that, that kind of says to us, you are more than you thought. Mm -hmm. uh, the course in the, cha in the section beyond the body from chapter 18, which I quote not once but twice in the chapter, says, yeah, it's, it's, it's an experience where you realize you're not confined to the physical body and you actually start to join with what you thought was out there. And of course, when you start to join with it, it's no longer out there. It's, it's a part of you. And that opens us up beyond, beyond the limits of what the ego thought it was. But, but, you know, don't kid yourself. You don't have to, um, you know, go to Tibet and climb the Himalayas to have this kind of profound experience. You know, you, you can go out on your city block and uh you know stare at clouds or stare at a pattern of pigeon crap on the ground um <laughs> and and the potential is there mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. in you it's not out there as we said last time you know lesson uh, 29 god is in everything i see because god is in my mind it starts here and then it moves from there to you know fill up our perception so it's really important not to get caught up on, you know, the circumstances or the trigger, although, you know, sometimes we need that, you know, sometimes we need, okay, I've set it up in this way, I'm going to this workshop with this absolutely amazing special human being, but as you said, Bruce, once you've had the experience, once that's in there, um, it, it's yours and you can replicate it in other circumstances because you know what it feels like in other words it begins to generalize why does it generalize because it's truth you know you you're not going to get rid of it it is more real than anything else so it starts to pop up in these other places and mm -hmm. that's as it should be yeah exactly. you know that's as it should be yeah. Um, yeah the generalizing is is again that seems like that's um because the course even though it seems like you know it's positioned as you know, there's a workbook that's only got 365 lessons so that, that a lot of people say, oh, well, I, I did the course, you know, I, I did the workbook, yeah. you know, <laughs> I did it that this year. This course is only a beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yet, you know, it, it seems like it takes quite a while, you know, and I think, you know, I know you've probably been studying it about a decade longer than I have, but uh, it's still, it's, you know, several decades later, it's like, wow, I think I'm finally beginning to get an idea yeah. that if I can, can really, you know, listen to what it's saying and it says, you know, you're much too tall in your mind wandering and catch myself, you know, yes. making a big deal out of something that isn't a big deal. Uh, then I can, I can, you know, have more of those, those little mini mystical moments um, by just, you know, letting go of, of, it doesn't mean I, I'm not doing things. It just means that I'm not invested in the outcome and I still, you know, I'm going to do the same things I would do otherwise. Well, we're here talking, you know, I mean, yeah, and yeah. Uh, you, when we need computers and monitors that we have to pay for to do that, et cetera. Right. Yeah. But, but yeah, the goal isn't that. The goal becomes that inner peace and carrying that wherever you go. Joining with 
others in relationships, joining with the world of perception, as opposed to splitting off from it by seeing differences or specialness. Exactly, exactly. And I think that brings up another category of experiences that, you know, if we need to rely on a training wheel, I think, you know, joining with other people, even though the course says, you know, there's no one else out there ultimately, um, but doing that with the intention of, seeing everyone as your savior, everyone is, is your, your long lost best friend. Um, and, and recognizing that in truth, that's absolutely accurate, um, becomes a wonderful gateway back to a place where, you know, we kind of disconnect from all the contingencies that we've, yes. and the barriers that we've put place to peace. And that's a good uh, trailer moment for the next uh, couple chapters in the book too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where, where, you know, I mean, in the next chapter, I, I'm sort of looking at our impulse to connect and join, mm -hmm. you know, as humans. Uh, and that's really what the whole second book is about, um, you know, from loving one to one love. It's, it's that recognition that we start off from a place of every relationship is a special relationship because each one you know, gives, we think each one gives us something particular. Um, in a sense, they're all transactional, even though we don't want to look at them that way. And moving from that stance to a, you know, a far deeper recognition where, yeah, we're all one, we're all in it together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can't get out without you getting out too. Um, and, uh, you know, either we all hold hands and sing Kumbaya and do it together, or uh, we all fall apart and it gets pretty ugly. Uh, <laughs> guess which way the world's been going uh, for most of its history. And guess what, guess what we can do uh, to make that change? Not because of some altruistic impulse, but because it's what we all want. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that's the only thing that really truly makes us consistently happy and peaceful. Yeah. 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 I was reminded of um, a quote from Ram, Ram Das. We're all walking each other home. You know, I really like that. Oh, one that's lovely. Yeah. Cause oh, it, it, really, it really is yeah. just, you know, I hadn't heard that. Yeah. It's just, you know, if we can remember that <laughs> when, when we, you know, we appear to be struggling, it's like, well, why not, you know, help a friend and, and, and uh, recognize that we're, we're helping ourselves and, and, and watch the, the you know, the, like you say, the altruistic motives that, you know, are truly there and then see how ego, you know, uh, wants to co-opt those and make it about, you know, the, the little less self and yes. just, just, just kind of sort those things out. And then, then the, the real genuine caring, uh, is beyond the special love and the special hate, you know, and, uh, but it takes, it yeah. takes practice of look, just looking at the, um, you know, the ego's, you know, counterfeit fraudulent <laughs> motivations, you know, catching them is just saying that's not evil, sinful, or wicked. It's just silly. You know, it's just, it's just, and kind it of, doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. From a very, like a, you know, using science in its maybe highest aspects is, is, yes. is, is saying, you know, this, this just, is a non-functional zero efficacy technique. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're trying to build your house based on two plus two equals five, or if you've got a, a ruler where, you know, the inch marks are all different, um, you know, it, it, it's not going to work out terribly well. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's where we live. You know, we, we've tried to build that house, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, and, and I mean, the course is so clear that that it doesn't ask us to accept it on faith. If anything, it's just the opposite. You know, that introduction to the workbook, excuse me, that introduction to the workbook tells us, you know, just do the lessons. Don't judge them. You might actively disagree with them. Just don't make any exceptions and do them. Mm -hmm. And they'll show you that they're accurate, that they're, tr that they're true. Um, and that's the only way that we can be let out of this because, you know, it, it's, the matrix is pretty compelling, like we talked about last time. It, it feels pretty real. And if you look at the, the number of infinite variations of things to want, um, and then start thinking about that in terms of the idea of other lifetimes, uh, I did a lot of uh, 
uh, work once uh, over the years at uh, the Monroe Institute in mm -hmm. uh, Faber, Virginia. Bob Monroe wrote a book called Journeys Out of the Body, yep. which I actually don't recommend because it was very fearful. But he also wrote a book called Far Journeys, which that's I do one. recommend. Yes, yeah. that's a great one. And, um, you know, one of the things that he talked about in Far Journeys was kind of this this cycling of, you know, these spiritual beings that see this glowing energy ball that is, you know, call it the earth, but it's, it, it's all of the energetics of the earth. And they go, woo, what is that? And they get closer. And then it's like, oh, I want to play in that sandbox. And they dive in and they have some horrible lifetime. You know, they're abused, killed, murdered, um, impoverished because they don't know how to manipulate reality and the next time they go oh i'm coming back as a really strong you know person and they join an army and then they're all ambushed and killed and and if you think about it it's sort of like this is the this is this is the path of karma you know all right i made one choice wasn't really good didn't work out now i'm going to try to adjust and do something different up oh, nope that didn't work out either no and we can do that for lifetime after lifetime, year after year, and at some point, to quote, you know, Bill Thetford, there must be a better way. Mm -hmm. Or to quote the course, tolerance for pain may be high, but it's not without limit. Mm -hmm. Eventually, everyone begins to recognize, however dimly, that there must be a better way. Um, so, so, you know, you take this path of karma within one life and probably um, in multiple lifetimes, until you realize that there's this other path that cuts through all of it that says, oh, no, you know, I've been trying to find water in a desert. And, you know, or as I say in, in From Nevermind to Evermind, you know, we're looking for our keys under a street lamp. But there really is no street lamp. There's no light. And that's not where we lost the keys in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so look once again, <laughs> you know. Yeah, exactly. um, but as long as we're searching in, in, this, in this realm, we don't get the experience that, that, that practically shows us that, that the, this realm doesn't work, but that that's not the end. You know, if that was the only place you got to, I mean, to me, that's kind of pure nihilism or maybe existentialism in its purest form. No meaning here. Do whatever you want. Um, you're all going to be dead at the end. And end of story um but the and the course is is telling you that but then it says but that's not reality mm -hmm. and if you're following reality here here's this better way mm -hmm. uh and so in this chapter i was just um you know hoping to illustrate sort of the fruits of that better way when you first begin to perceive them um and and as you said being able to hold that sense of inner peace i mean you know we both uh, work for the Foundation for Inner Peace, um, which was a name that Helen Schuckman got from the voice of Jesus. Uh, that, that's one of the goals, you know, uh, as the ego sees it. Love might look different than inner peace, but no, they're just, you know, two facets of the same diamond. Uh, you know, that's the goal. So, so however we get to it, the circumstances don't matter. It's the experience. And then from that experience, building more trust and as we both said, generalizing from it, you know, the course is very clear. If we're all one mind, we have to learn that at the level of the individual minds. But then it starts to generalize. And, you know, forgiveness learned in one relationship becomes much easier to apply to other relationships. And, and, and hey, this is how we this is salvation. This is how we wake each other up. This is how we walk each other home, as, yeah. as you said. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it kind of ties into one of the, the, the sections uh, that you talk about in this chapter is an expanded, expansive sense of self. And when we, when yeah. we have an inclusive way of thinking, and I think a lot of those mystical experiences, even, even in maybe, you know, some of those more challenging lifetimes where <laughs> it's all about the warfare and conquest and so forth, that, you know, there, there's got to be in every lifetime uh, moments where, you know, people let down that ego guard and, and are confronted with, you know, it must be a better way. Even, even if that's pushed away, there's still that, that ever-present, eternal, infinitely patient voice within everyone. And, and I think that, yeah. that reminder is, is basically, uh, I think, think, something that helps us 
develop tremendous compassion, not only for the so-called others, but, but uh, ourselves, because we're all, you know, fighting the same hard battle and we're all wanting to, to go beyond the crazy shenanigans of the ego and, and, uh, and see that connection on a, on a more regular and on, ideally on completely ongoing basis. And uh, yeah, that was one of the reasons I took that. I, I, I use a quote in this chapter from um, Eugene O'Neill's Long Day's Journey into Night. I could have pulled quotes from any number of mystics that uh, kind of make the same point. But the play, which is autobiographical, and in my mind, unquestionably O'Neill's best work, uh, it's so depressing. You know, it's, um, you know, his, the mother is mentally ill, the father is an alcoholic and a braggart, and he could care less about anyone. Um, the older brother is an alcoholic, if I recall. And yet, in the middle of all of this, you know, the, the father and this youngest son, they're having this discussion and sharing, you know, the father is being candid and sharing some of his regrets about the path he took in life, and he's not trying to con anyone or mm -hmm. pull one over. And the character who represents O'Neill talks about, he's a sailor, and he talks about different mystical experiences he's had. You know, these times where the, the clouds of suffering break up, and you're just filled with love. Uh, he even uses the word God, albeit reluctantly, because, you know, I mean, my God, God has such a bad reputation thanks to a formal religion, um, you know. <laughs> um, but I thought it was just such a beautiful little, um, I mean, I remember the first time I read it, I was awed because here in the midst of, you know, what might be one of the best depictions of just how bad the ego's world can be um, is this beautiful little gem that soars free and tells us, no, there, there's, there's more to it. You know, there, there is a better way, not there must be, there is. Yeah, I, I suppose in every moment, even if it isn't a rock bottom, you know, face down drunk in the gutter <laughs> experience. Yeah. But, but in every little little disappointment, there's an opportunity to say, "Oh, I could see peace instead of this." I could, you know, I, I'm I'm not upset for the reason I think. I'm actually, you know, upset because I'm seeing something that's not there uh, through the lens of a distorted. Uh, seemingly silly separate sense of self <laughs> yeah that, that is yeah. just you know a, a, a misunderstanding that uh, uh i don't have to identify with once i recognize there's a real alternative that's right mm -hmm. and you know it, it it's kind of like in the 12-step world you know there's this term hitting bottom and i actually wrote quite a bit about it in um, my first book from plagues to miracles because i i, I kind of view that uh the tenth plague as that point where okay there's no going forward um you know either you change or you die uh so hitting bottom is a very interesting concept because it is not carved in stone ten commandment metaphor sorry um, <laughs> where one you know i think i say in that book you know one drunk's bottom might be um wow, I really said something inappropriate at that party. I'd better watch my drinking. Someone else's might be, oh my God, I just killed an entire family while drunk in the car. Um, that, that the bottom has nothing to do with external circumstances, mm -hmm. really. It's mm -hmm. that point at which you as a being recognize that the path you are on does not work. Um, so it is that point practically of saying, you know, all right, I've tolerated pain and my tolerance was high, but now I have to find that better way where that bottom point comes. You know, some people, um, suffer mightily. Others seem not at all. They're just like, but, but, you know, we need, I mean, all of those ranges count, um, they're all valid and they're all living within the ego's world of time. So in a sense, they're all illusion anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You yeah, know, I, whatever I, I, your particular path is, is all that matters. Yeah, exactly. I was just thinking as you're sharing that, I was thinking, you know, that, that's one of the, I think certainly for people new to the course and, and for those who are familiar with it, one of the more challenging ideas is that there's no order of difficulty in miracles. And that's, yeah. you know, very, very first page of the text, very first principle. Yeah. And it's like, 
well, if that's true, then, then, you know, something that seems horrific, you know, for one person that is just kind of like, you know, just brush aside kind of <laughs> no, no big deal for someone else. But in a sense, anything that, you know, the, the most small irritation is no different than, than, you know, raging fury or whatever the quote yeah. goes, you know, something like that. And, um, and that's kind of a reminder that, that anything that disrupts our, our peace of mind is basically choosing an identity that um, says, I'm not, I don't want that mystical experience just this moment. And, and there's yeah. nothing wrong with that, but, but eventually, you know, we'll get tired of that and we'll want to have a more consistent, peaceful uh, experience and, and recognize that there is actually a way to do that. And it's by, yeah. you know, forgiving ourselves for the belief that that was even possible and, and that we were able to choose that. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, I, I sometimes think maybe it's more difficult for someone like Tom Brady um, to wake up because life does appear to be working so well. You know, if it's working, why try to fix it? But I promise you, Tom Brady will have to retire someday. He won't be able to play football. He might open restaurants that aren't terribly good because, you know, he's getting into that late. Um, we are all, you know, Again, I, I, I come back to the Buddha's um, first noble truth and his, his insights when he, as a you know, young man, left the palace grounds or so the myth goes and, and sees, uh, what is it, you know, a sick person, uh, an aging person in a corpse and realizes these are inescapable. Um, you know, when you realize those are inescapable, then, yeah, you better look somewhere else for, um, for happiness. So, so in a way those places where we're suffering and where we haven't been able to get what we thought we wanted from the world outside, those actually are fairly profound opening or potential openings for going, wait a minute, you know, um, choose once again, not, okay, I tried that bar and I didn't find anyone there I liked. So let me try a different bar on the other side of town. I mean, you know, you can try as many bars as you like, literally or metaphorically. Um, they're all going to bar you from the truth. But, um, but recognizing that, yeah, you know, I, 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 I've been looking outward. I need to look inward. That, that's the ultimate uh, take home. Uh, no pun intended. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it also, what we were just sharing with um, reminded me of, you know, an idea that I think is, is, uh, evident in the course a lot is that uh, in in the curriculum, the the contrast between the insanity of the ego and the peace of the Holy Spirit is is really you know brought forth dramatically in in pretty much every section. It's, it, there's no kind of little timid tiptoeing around, and 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 sometimes the the la language is so graphic it's like my gosh. And yet when you read it, you realize you know. There really is either this this profound peace or this complete absence of it, and yeah. and we cover over the absence with all kinds of you know effectively narcotics, uh, cosmetics, uh, you know diversions, uh, camouflages, uh, prop propagandas of every sort. Uh, I'm just throwing a bunch of words out, but but you know all all the different strategies that the ego uses to try to to make it's horrific uh, lack of peace more palatable, but eventually we all come to this like, hey, you know, I, I, this, none of this is working. I really want that, that yeah. sustainable peace, that, that, you know, that those truly perfect moments, and I want them to be more than just a moment, and I want them to, to you know, be able to be strung together and eventually have nothing but that, and, and that's what, what our curriculum suggest is not only possible, but inevitable, that experience. Huh? Yeah, and I mean, for myself, that was one of the big um, obstacles to starting the course was that um, that stark counterpoint, there's truth, light, love, and then there's what isn't, which is illusion, but which feels real to us. Mm. And, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking, yeah, we try to live in this middle zone, um, you know, 50,000 shades of gray, if you will, mm -hmm. um, with, and, and trying to convince ourselves that 
no, no, these are, you know, these are real when really they're just variations on darkness uh, and we need to wake up to light. <laughs> right. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Vi vision that, in, that leaves one person out of a perfect innocence and perfect oneness is not real vision, right? <laughs> no, it's not real vision. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And that's why those mystical experiences, you know, tend to be, you know, filled with accounts of where I couldn't, you know, find any fault with anyone or anything, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, it, and the, the language of course can vary widely, but, but there's, there's always that quality to it of, of not needing to defend or, or, you know, about the only thing that maybe uh, sort of after the fact, uh, a tendency I, it seems was maybe to share the experience and even that, you know, falls short because a lot of times the quality yeah. of that is ineffable and, 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 but, but the, the hard quality, to get it in words. Yeah. Yeah. The quality I think comes across is that, you know, the, the more we find the piece, whether it's through a, a, a study group or our own, our own reading or, or just day-to-day -day practice when we recognize that, that, gee, I could, I could actually um, do what I'm doing and listen to my inner, inner kindness teacher and, and have fun without, you know, being attached to the outcome by just watching the contents of my mind, of my mind and, and, uh, and, you know, seeing what works and what doesn't work. Uh, eventually that, that starts paying off and being, you know, you, you, you find yourself more and more peaceful, huh? Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, I mean, the experience, you know, we've talked about how it can be triggered by, you know, beautiful vistas. Um, I talk about, I, I sort of catalog a number of other ways that it comes to us, but, but, you know, sometimes it really, the mystic does show up in the most unexpected places. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking specifically about, you know, Helen Shuckman's mystical experience known as the subway experience, where she hated taking the subway, thought of it as, you know, all of these smelly, you know, horrible people. Um, and one day had to take it with her husband and she's down there just like, oh, you know, get away. And the car fills with light. And, um, and this predated A Course in Miracles by quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when she sees a priestess sort of kneeling and, you know, there it is. A New York City subway car becomes, you know, one of the holiest spots on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's what you were saying earlier, Bruce. Every place is potentially a holy place. Exactly. Uh, exactly. We, we make it that or we prevent it from being that. Um, it, it's our call. Yeah. Artificial constraints, huh? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been really, really helpful and, and, and fun. Is there anything else that you wanted to, to share? I know there's a lot of things that you talked about here, you know, like a pervasive sense of peacefulness, overwhelming, unconditional love, total absorption in the moment, profound conviction of holiness, sense of presence. I mean, some uh -huh. of these things are just wonderful examples of the qualities of those experiences. Um, I mean, maybe there's, other things that thank you that, yeah that you want to share i'd like but, people to just check out the book yeah oh yeah um, it's, i it's do have wonderful. i want to i do want to share one other thing because it is valentine's day so um if you're interested uh you being listeners i i put up on my youtube channel a talk that i gave um between groundhog day and valentine's day uh three years ago in 2016 that i'm particularly fond of uh, you know, it, it, it goes into all the metaphor and such, but I think people will enjoy it. Okay. And um, what, what the, 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 the little trailer moment I'll give is, yes, here we have this holiday that's all about special love. Uh, and it's dedicated, you know, to the God Cupid. And it has some actually really horrible origins in the Roman holiday of uh, Lupercania or something where men would knock women unconscious and drag them off for sex. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there'd be a woman in the world who'd want a Valentine's Day card under those circumstances. No. But the, the central Greek myth, and, and you know, myths are such powerful repositories of truth. The central Greek myth around the god Cupid, whom the Greeks called Psyche, is the story of Cupid, uh, Cupid and Psyche, or Amor and Psyche, where she sleeps at night, he falls in love with her, you know, he 
someone takes his arrow, I think, and it hits her. No, he he's hit with his own arrow, and she is the first woman he sees. Oh, that's, right. that's right. That's right. Yep. But he is a god, so he can only visit her at night, and she doesn't know the identity of her real lover. And eventually, you know, someone, I think it's maybe her sisters or some jealous god, convinces her, you have this demon visiting you, and you need to light a candle and trick him and see his true face. And she does this, and of course, the moment she sees his true face, she recognizes he's a god, but in that moment, he also disappears. I think it's a very, very wonderful, profound metaphor that special love occurs in darkness. We don't know the face of the other. Mm -hmm. And that face is actually the face of a god. <laughs> We're all god. We're all really loving god. But when we try to capture that in the world of form by, you know, I'm going to look on it and I want to know who is this being who's really there. Another way of looking at it is special love thrives on fantasy, uh, darkness. And when we penetrate the fantasy and go, all right, now I'm living with this character, you know, who are they really? The whole charade falls apart. But what we don't often hear is the rest of the story where I think it's the goddess Venus, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, assigns Psyche a series of tasks to perform that in the course of performing them, she sort of comes into her own fullness as, as a woman. And from that place, she meets Cupid's Psyche again, and now their relationship is, is um, cemented but at a level where it can be sustained. So self-knowledge, but I would put a capital S in there, mm -hmm. is what allows us to really have that relationship with the God in others. Um, but, you know, if you want to, it's, it's only about a half hour talk. I gave it as the message at a Unity Church um, in uh, Asbury, New Jersey. But it was one of those that I had the most fun with. And so it being Valentine's Day, I uh, just thought I'd share it. Yeah, My I'll YouTube look for channel it. Is, I'll yeah, look for it's Robert it. Rosenthal, MD. Okay. Um, if I don't find it, yeah. I'll email you to get the link and I'll put it on the post. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, that Great. Would be, yeah. Seeing it. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Cool. But, but yeah, so there's my Valentine's gift to uh, anyone <laughs> listening, even if you're not nice. listening on Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Any more uh, concluding remarks? Uh, uh, I mean, there's, there's, this is one of your shorter chapters, but there's still a yeah. lot in there. There's a lot. Needless to um, say. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've known people um, and counted myself among them at one point who just craved that mystical experience and they're going to get it no matter what. Uh, it's a letting go process. You know, let yourself be surprised. You know, if, if, if you try to determine the form, um, it may not work as well. And if you're strongly guided to a particular experience, like the King's Chamber at Giza or the Monroe Institute or what have you, um, trust that guidance because sometimes we do need particular forms to help us loosen the, um, the constraints that the ego mind puts around us. Mm -hmm. um, trust Holy Spirit. You know, that, that would be my take home for just about anything. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Bob. And it's always, always fun to talk with you and, uh, looking forward to the next conversation so we can. Thank you, Bruce. It's continue. a delight. Thank you for hosting and oh, uh, my, making this available to, to so many people. I, I deeply appreciate it. My yeah. pleasure. Okay.